Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many different lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, just to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook um, and we will also have it um, up on our Pharma Health webpage uh, later today. Uh, so just to introduce today's webinar, um, the findings from the Royal Commission um, resulted in a total of 74 recommendations. Uh, so 65 of those were from the final report and nine from the interim report. So the National Centre for Pharma Health have been working to support the Victorian government uh, to share information about these findings and the resulting recommendations um, about the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system. And today we're really focusing on um, those recommendations and findings that are most relevant for people uh, from our farming communities. So the work that we've done so far um, around this is that we uh, currently have a, a dedicated page on our Pharma Health website, uh, highlighting some of those findings and recommendations from the Royal Commission. And we've also been sharing relevant material across our social media pages on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, so today's webinar is a really fantastic opportunity to hear from our farming community members that contributed their stories um, to the Royal Commission. Um, and online with us today, we have Kelly Barnes and Al Gab, and I'll introduce each of them um, as we come to, to their opportunity to tell us their stories. Um, we'll also hear from Matthew Herkus, uh, who's from the Department of Health, to learn more about how the recommendations from the Royal Commission will be rolled out and how you as community members can get involved in that process. Um, so the format for today's session, uh, we'll hear from our three panel members and then we'll open things up for questions at the end. Um, we'd really like to encourage you to include your questions in the Q&A function. Um, so you'll see that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, so if there is somebody in particular you'd like to address your question to, if you just leave their name in that Q&A and then follow that with your question. Uh, and then we'll invite our panel members to respond at the end of their presentations. Uh, so kicking off today, um, we would like to introduce Kelly Barnes. I'll just one moment and I will bring Kelly up. Great. Um, so Kelly comes from a, a family farm in the south of England originally and has worked on farms and in agribusiness roles in the UK, New Zealand and also in Australia, obviously. Uh, so Kelly developed a passion for health and well-being in farming communities following a diagnosis of a chronic pain condition. And um, that, that uh, condition forced her to move to off-farm work. Uh, so Kelly's honoured to be named the Victorian AgriFutures Rural Women's Award winner for 2020 with her Working Dog Training School. And this school encourages social connection and the use of working dogs as a support tool to build mental resilience in farming communities. Kelly participated in the community consultations in Hamilton as part of the Royal Commission and is really excited to see the implementation of the recommendations. So I'd love to invite Kelly to share her, um, her uh, recollection, I guess, of um, contributing to the Royal Commission and also her hopes for those recommendations as we move forward into the implementation phase. Thank you, Kelly. Great. Thanks, Ali. So um, I guess the first thing is why did I go to the consultations in the first place? Um, and I think for me, it's it's become evident that like a lot of the people doing the research don't necessarily have lived experience and that like that consultation and that lived experience and what we want and how we found that the process is really crucial to developing. And I think if we don't speak up 
as people that have had to access certain resources, then we really, um, it's really difficult for us to expect people to create any change and create any framework moving forward. So um, I um, I attended the consultation here in Hamilton and I found it really welcoming. It was a really comfortable environment. Um, it was really good to meet other people that have lived, lived experience from all different um, settings and hear their stories. It's quite eye-opening for me to hear about the issues in our area. I guess I didn't really know or hadn't really had that many conversations with people on the topic of mental health and, um, and having to access resources. So I personally haven't needed crisis support, um, but I've used psychologists and I've gone, um, I've got a mental health plan with the GP and things like that. So I wasn't really aware of what happens when you're in crisis mode. Um, and it really highlighted to me that the shortfalls in the processes and, um, and places that we can do better. So I definitely have found it difficult to find appointment times here. Um, being in Hamilton, most of them are nine to five. I used to work in the shearing shed, so obviously it was a full day. Um, you couldn't duck off for an hour. Quite often I'd be an hour from the local centre, so an hour from Hamilton. Um, so that to me was definitely a challenge and something I brought up in the discussion. Um, Penny, I found really, really welcoming and they, they had a member from the team sit on each table and just sit down with us and have a really open, welcoming discussion, which was really good. Um, and they were genuinely interested in what we wanted to say and, and generally interested in people's experience. You could also see they were quite taken aback. So I think they, when they came to Hamilton, they probably hadn't done a lot of like regional consultations at that stage. And they were really genuinely concerned and taken aback by the lack of resources or the length of time it took um, for people to get support or what happened when people went in for crisis care. So um, yeah, it was really nice, you know, nice for them to really get an understanding and, and they genuinely took it on board. So um, when I left the room that day, I really felt like they were dedicated to making a change. I had confidence that they were going to make something happen and make a difference, whereas I think, you know, quite often we see a lot of information and a lot of people um, saying they're going to do something, but they're not, nothing ever happens. And I really felt leaving there that day that they were really dedicated to making a change. So that was really nice. Um, during the consultation, I also made a connection with a lady that I hadn't met before. She lived in Hamilton um, and we've kept in touch. She's had experience of depression and um, it really, she reached out to me and it highlights the power of connecting with people. So sharing your story, being open about your story um, and how when you're given a platform, you open up and you make those new connections. So I think that's something aside from actually the, you know, the um, organisers of these days getting information, I think it really brought everyone together and allowed you to connect with other people that were in a similar situation. So that was a nice part of, um, a nice sort of added bonus of attending the day. So I think for me, some of the recommendations, like I know there's a lot of recommendations here and um, I've just sort of briefly highlighted a few, but for me, it's all about prevention. So I think yeah, recommendations 15 and 16, where they talk about working with your community and working with your workplaces, I think they're really crucial as well when you're working with regional areas. So um, delivering to small and isolated communities is so important. Um, I really hope the resources are allocated in a way that we can provide funding for peer support services. So being run by familiar faces, by people you know in these local communities, um, it's really important to use people that they trust um, to open up the conversation. And I think for me, every single one of us has mental health and I think it should be seen in the same way as physical health. So really putting that preventative approach to it. Um, I'd like to see funds allocated to preventative resources and initiatives that really encourage all of us to start thinking about our own mental health in the same way that we do our physical health. And I think that really ties in with um, where they're focusing on community and workplaces, not just on um, mental illness. Um, the funding for schools, I really 
really love that idea. I think there's a huge potential to work with schools and work with children at a younger age. And um, in regional Victoria, it might look slightly different, but really focused on building those skills and, and giving those children the tools to manage through tough times so that they're, they're perhaps not getting as far down the mental illness route as they would do otherwise. Um, so incentives to attract mental health and wellbeing workers is one thing, but I also think we've got so many opportunities to include mental health and wellbeing conversations in everyday life. So I'd really like to see in those incentives for workplaces and organisations to include training about mental health and mental illness. Um, so service providers, for example, out here in regional Vic, they're seeing a lot of clients on a daily basis. So this could be a bank manager. Um, and they're often the only contact that that person might have during the day or during the week. So I think it's really important that we're educating these service providers, allowing them to identify when a client may be struggling, um, ensuring that they know where to direct their clients when they need to seek help. So the more people in rural communities that we can get talking about mental health and wellbeing and normalising it, the more we'll reach out when they need help at an earlier stage and they're not needing crisis support and complex care. Um, so I think the other thing, probably I think I've done a bit of work um, with the co-design of different projects and I really like that idea. I really hope that we can see more funding going into co-design and lived experience and really working with those grassroots community members. The other thing is the Aboriginal, so social and emotional well-being of the Aboriginal people. I think that re we really need to work on that and really, um, you know, involve their own people with the co-design and things like that. I think there's a lot of work that we can do there. Um, retaining workers is an interesting topic and I think COVID, pre-COVID, I think it would have been very different, but COVID's brought on this whole new set of challenges and opportunities. So there's a, this exodus from the city and, and with it, hopefully these skilled mental health workers, but on the flip side, the demand for mental health support generally across the country is at an all time high. So I think it's really gonna pose a challenge. We've got this influx of people that perhaps wouldn't normally move away from the city into regional areas, but the demand on them is so much higher and we need so many more people. So. Um, honestly, I think we're facing one of the toughest challenges yet with, um, with mental illness. And just to me, the preventative measures and awareness are some of our biggest allies. And I really hope that um, some of the findings allow us to really put funding into these, um, these preventative approaches in this co-design space. So um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing from the other panelists about this and seeing where we can go and um, how we can work together on this. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Kelly, for sharing your experience and, and your hopes for the recommendations um, and the rollout of the, the recommendations in, into our rural farming community. That was really, really wonderful for you to share. Uh, so now I'd just like to um, move across to LGAP. So just bear with me a moment. Hi, Al. Great. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much. Good eye. Um, so Al is a family farmer from Skipton in Western Victoria. Um, so Al's taken an ongoing interest in mental health in the light of his own lived experience in this area. Um, he's always strived to help people in his own way, particularly through having conversations about mental health and especially in the bush. Um, Al was an expert witness for the Royal Commission and he was one of only nine witnesses contributing to the rural hearing in Maryborough. Um, so Al, I'd love to hear from you about your experience um, as an expert witness and also your hopes for the, for the rollout of the recommendations from the Royal Commission. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Alison. Yes, yeah, so like, like Alison says, um, I was a witness at the Maryborough hearings for for the Royal Commission, I think it was in 2009, stand to be correct on that one. Um, 
it was a humbling experience, but it was also a very uh, eye-opening experience listening to other people present their versions of what they've been lived experiences were as well. Um, the, the system and the, the Penny and her team um, managed it very, very well. It was, a, it was, a, you were very well catered for as, as a witness um, for the day and, and, and post as well. Oddly enough, that's sort of led into other things for me as well. I actually ended up getting asked to speak at the, um, the, the, the um, sitting for parliament when they handed down these findings. Um, and that was a little bit daunting. Actually, I'm probably finding this a little bit more daunting than that. But So one thing led to another, but the, the experience on the day, what Penny and her team were asking myself and other witnesses to do was to tell them my personal lived experience with mental health. And, and while I've never been hospitalised, I've checked myself into emergencies at um, Ballarat Hospital, so, and I live approximately 45 minutes from there. And I guess I highlighted to the panel on that day the challenges that I faced um, in, you know, going through that process. And although, while I won't go into the detail, there were some big flaws in the system, you know, that, it, that it, you know, through the discharge of a patient from an emergency room, back out onto the streets, you know, in the early hours of the morning um, when I was, you know, in a suicidal state where the system was letting myself down and, and no doubt many other people. So I highlighted this to Penny and her team um, and they were very compassionate, but they were, I think they were also very shocked to hear real life experiences. And I'm only just one of many that presented, of course. So this is all obviously been compiled into the reports and has thus given us the, the, the findings and that now handed down um, at that special sitting of parliament. The, the flow on effects as a person living in a rural community are quite unusual. You know, I've had people I know come up to me, you know, that are of all generations, right from my mothers and fathers, right down to sort of teenage years, and have not poured their heart out, but have said that they've given that me as a sort of a one man wolf pack for better of analogy, because I don't really sort of, you know, stick to any sort of decent train, but has given them the power to, you know, one person in particular, to give them the power to talk to their wife about their emotional issues. And this is a person well in their seventies. So, you know, and have been married all their lives. So, for me, that's a win. And then just like two weeks ago, I had a phone number left at the Skipton Roadhouse for me by a woman at Warwick and Bill who had picked up the paper and read an article about me earlier in the year and how it had helped her in her own ways and her own struggles to go and get help and those sorts of things. So when you're getting feedback like this, I guess it makes you feel as a person that what you're doing, albeit minute as just a one person doing their little bit to help the greater cause is having positive results for the community and the greater good of the conversation of mental health and in actual fact I guess it doesn't get any higher than you know a, a royal commission on a state base or whether it's state or federal but in this case state um, so it's, it's been quite humbling but it's also to get that feedback from locals and complete and utter strangers in, in actual fact um, is, 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 is really quite humbling. The, the telling of my story, I've been very open with it. Um, I'll tell anybody that wants to listen as much as they want to hear. Um, and I guess that's just who I am as a person. Other people really struggle to talk about their emotional or mental challenges in life. And I've, I've had a great, huge help from family and friends and professional help through my journey in this. And to be honest with you, I wouldn't be here without that. So it's, I suppose that leads me into the other part of it. What would I like to see come out of this commission? And while I can't detail, you know, finding one, two to 74 of them, I, my focus is on rural 
people and people living in the bush, whether it's here in Victoria or, or nationwide for that matter. And the bridging of the gap between rural services and city services is such a, it's such a big thing. And, and I guess if you want to get political about it, you know, we can all point fingers at politicians left and right and, and so they always forget about the country and all facets of, of, their, of their political careers. But the bridging of the gap, you know, when you've, and to go back to my story about getting put back on the, discharge from the hospital, back onto the street at, in the early hours of the morning as a suicidal person. Now, I'm not saying that doesn't happen in the city, but I had to do it, then drive 45 minutes home. I didn't just catch the tram around the corner or whatever it might have been. And how, how, does, how, do, how does they implement changes for that? Um, Kelly touched on getting people to practice in the bush, you know, whether whether the bush is Ballarat and yes, Ballarat and Geelong are deemed regional as far as, you know, regions go. And, but there's greater, more remote places in Victoria, far east Gippsland, the northwest of the state, the southwest of the state. Um, how do we attract people to practice in those areas? How do you get them there and get them to stay? Um, because while you can have programs to get graduates out into the into the bush a lot of them generally migrate back into the cities rule of thumb not necessarily always but and then how do you get people into the smaller centers the bush nursing hubs where your local your local lads and women who don't like going to the towns you know they live in the bush for a reason but they're happy to go to the local bush nursing center and get their covid jab or whatever it might be how, how do we get services through there? And, you know, it does, does that involve travelling road shows? I don't know. But it's something that I know I take a pretty big interest in and I haven't got any answers. <laughs> I've got ideas, but it's um, it's something which I think is a very much a moving target. And I guess I suppose I, I pose the question to, you know, the the... the people from the government in, in this space is have things changed dramatically since the findings were written up and handed down in the light of COVID? And my gut feeling would be, yes, they have changed dramatically. The space has moved from here to here. And I definitely don't have an answer for that or I don't even have an idea. But I guess it's a challenge that while these findings have been handed down, that I guess I, I pose to the to the government and the people representing them. Do do these findings necessarily are they a concrete thing or can, can they be elastic enough to cope with the change that well not only Victoria let's face it the whole world has faced with the change of COVID and no doubt has increased the you know the the, the cases of mental health. Um, right across the world, for, in, in fact. So it would be a shame to see that the good work of the, of the Royal Commission to be so narrow-minded by these findings, and I know you've got to stick to a track once it's been sort of laid in a governmental way, but to, to be elastic enough to, 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 to cater for change and, 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 and bridging that gap once again to, and to, to reiterate that the change back from Melbourne in this case, because that's our that's our state's capital to the bush, is is a great challenge because you can throw all the money you want in certain areas, but if you can't get the people to implement the change, um, yeah, that, that's such a challenge. But you know, I think Kelly touched on you know there's the migration out of the city to the bush as well, so you know that might be a positive. So, um, I think. I think that just about wraps me up, but yeah, I, it's, it's such a broad and a, it's a huge problem in our society. And I think that's evident through this. And I applaud, I applaud the state government for, for having this Royal Commission. And I, I, I think a lot of good's going to come of it. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Al, for sharing your experiences and, and your insights there. That's really fantastic. Um, couple of things that I 
noticed, you know, came up through both Kelly and Al's conversation there was that real emphasis on lived experience. And it's really, it's just adds a whole level of insight and knowledge to hear from people's experiences. And, and that was certainly noted as part of the part of the process of the Royal Commission, that lived experience was so critical. But I think also that even in sharing your lived experience with the with the Royal Commission, it's had a real flow on effect and has continued to to, to stimulate conversations within community um, and in our rural communities, which is really fantastic. And I think, you know, um, Al was talking about some of those real challenges around um, that COVID um, pre is presenting for mental health. But I think uh, if there is a silver lining to COVID, it is that that, that, that whole discussion of, of mental health and, and the concern for people's mental well-being has become much more of a public one um, and much more of an accepted conversation to have now. Um, so you really, some really interesting points, Elle, that you raise. Um, and you were, you know, you were saying that you, you hope that the, the findings from the Royal Commission can be elastic within that kind of COVID environment. And I think this is a great opportunity now to cross over to Matthew Herkes from the Department of Health, who might be able to provide us with some of those, some of those answers and some of those plans for um, responding to those recommendations and rolling out the implementation. Um, so Matthew Herkes is Executive Director of the Mental Health and Alcohol and Other Drugs System Management, Mental Health and Wellbeing. It's quite a mouthful. Would not fit on a business card, I'm assuming, Matthew. <laughs> um, so with the Department of Health. Uh, so prior to that role, um, aside from a brief stint outside of the department in 2018, Matthew held the roles of Director of Rural Health and Director of Programs and Performance in Mental Health. So Matthew's worked within the department in various capacities since 2007. And Matthew's current role as executive director is to pro provide oversight, including funding allocation and performance monitoring of alcohol and other drug and mental health services. And that's inclusive of non-government and public health service delivered programs. Matthew's education includes a Bachelor of Nursing, Bachelor of Arts, a graduate certificate in health science and a master of public health. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, we really welcome you here today to um, give us a bit more insight into how the Royal Commission and the recommendations um, will roll out within our rural farming communities. Indeed, thank you, Alison, and good afternoon, everybody on the call. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, very delighted to have the opportunity to be here, but more delighted than anything else to and humbled to have actually had the opportunity to listen to Kelly and to Al prior. Um, certainly in acknowledging um, the lived experience that the Royal Commission has asked us to do and has deeply recommended through all of the implementation and, and all of the actions that lived experience being front and centre is key. And so I'd like to extend acknowledgements to Al and Kelly, particularly for um, the words of wisdom and the experience and reflections, but also to all on the call that have a lived experience of caring for somebody or even um, having the experience of mental ill health or others. And from the department as well, I'd also like to acknowledge that we met on the lands of traditional owners and we acknowledge those traditional owners, the Aboriginal people, wherever we are, elders past and present of never having ceded sovereignty of the land. And Kelly's comment too about um, the actual social and well, well, social and emotional and well-being components are really important. Um, Alison, I've got um, a set of slides which I'm not sure whether they've circulated around the group. Um, they were certainly comfortable to have been circulated, um, if that's appropriate. Um, we can certainly share those um, later on, Matthew. But you can share your screen um, I, I could, if you would yeah, like to. Yeah, I could Presenting do that. Um, although it might get in the way, so I'm happy to maybe do that if we need to if we get time at okay. the end to yep. speak. Because the themes that Kelly and Al were referring to are, are so deeply resonating with me that I might just vary a little bit, and the slides can be taken as read later on if that works for you folks. That sounds fine. Um, yeah, of course. Um, and to also, yeah, thanks. Um, and to also express um, my connection uh, to the rural environments that um, I'm from a little town called Dean's Marsh historically, and folks might remember Dean's Marsh being part of the 1983 Black Saturday. So as a very young person, you see the issue of 
school and this passion for mine around rural with each other is really fundamental and foundational for myself and my family. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, uh, I thought I might spend a bit of time perhaps on um, an overview of the reforms. Um, picking up, again, Al's point about COVID changes, emphasising the need now more than ever for changes and adjustments uh, to a system which um, has been broken for many years. Um, and to also note that um, the rural environments and the rural settings and some of the changes specifically that are being um, implemented will be a theme of the conversation if that um, works for the forum. Uh, and also touching on workforce, such a critical and foundational piece which Kelly um, and Al have picked up. Um, so in terms of where we are at the moment, um, Al is correct in, and to acknowledge Al was at the um, joint sitting of parliament, the historic joint sitting uh, at the exhibition buildings uh, and Kelly and Al have both been on the journey deeply of forums and consultations. Uh, the Royal Commission report landed and the Victorian government responded to that final report um, with this year's budget of $3.8 billion over four years. Uh, within that budget, um, there's $700 million which will roll out across um, rural and regional settings. So um, there is a significant investment to follow and work to plan that investment and to plan and implement that investment with that lived experience voice again, which is resonating for me through the conversations we've had. Uh, so it's, it's a turning point and it, we do need to um, take the Royal Commission recommendations and we will take the Royal Commission recommendations and are taking the Royal Commission recommendations um, uh, in the context of the genuine uh, reform to the system that they, um, that they do call out. Um, so in total, um, there are 65 recommendations in the final report. There are nine recommendations from the interim report. And for those that have had a chance to read the final report, um, folks will read sub-recommendations through text in each chapter. So it uh, certainly is a considered um, journey of reform and needing some planning uh, and consideration to get this right. Uh, so whilst this budget has been announced, the government has been clear in announcing the budget, successive state budgets, budgets will continue uh, to resource the reform um, with at least a 10 year um, roadmap being considered. Uh, in terms of regional investment I referenced before, um, and again, picking up Kelly and Al's experience and the communications and connections uh, that you've had with people uh, on your journey and subsequent to your journey, um, that the rural and regional settings uh, need changing. The services and the service types that we have on offer at the moment uh, need, need to be added to, we need new services. And importantly, again, the connections that um, Al and Kelly have drawn me to is the idea of local services that are accessible that enable um, access to those that work um, uh, full time and that are responsive. And the construct the Royal Commission has recommended is the local mental health and wellbeing services. Uh, the government uh, in March announced six of these, um, uh, including the local communities of Benalla, Greater Geelong and La Trobe Valley, uh, with 20 sites funded in the first budget that I referenced. Uh, in addition to the local services, um, and again, Al has referenced and, and, and told us of his deep experience and, and, and lived experience with Ballarat as a specialist service. We absolutely need to focus on um, uh, turning, changing, reforming the area services um, that are operated by health services, noting we need that local accessible um, help front door through locals, but the support for area services when and where, where required. Um, there's a focus in expanding um, suicide prevention responses uh, and continue statewide implementation and importantly across rural and regional Victoria, implementation of the hospital outreach post-suicidal engagement program, the HOPE program. And there's additional um, sites across um, sub-regional health services and including outreach, which is critical and important. Uh, Again, acknowledging Kelly's um, reference to the Aboriginal social emotional wellbeing and Aboriginal Victorians, uh, there's certainly commitment through the budget and the implementation uh, to deliver uh, expanded social and emotional wellbeing supports. Uh, there's been reference and resonated again, the idea of stigma and discrimination. And again, the powerful um, uh, messages that Kelly and Al have both uh, reminded us of that uh, bringing a story forward 
it does create comfort in others and all of us actually to also resonate on our own story. So it's certainly critical um, that Aboriginal uh, rural communities, uh, rural farming farmers and farming communities uh, will be looking uh, will be looking to those communities very closely um, to ensure that that lived experience and that voice and that leadership um, is coming uh, coming to the fore. Um, uh, Beyond Blue, uh, for instance, are looking at um, at some of the initiatives that they can put in place around both phone based and online support and creating accessibility there. And we want engagement with uh, rural um, communities around how that works for them. Agriculture Victoria and also the National Centre for Farmer Health, we're working in partnership with both those organisations over the next two years on programs and services that will support the construct of resilience in agriculture dependent rural communities. Um, and we know that Victoria's farmers and families have inordinate capacity to um, support each other and look after each other during tough times. And we would be looking to um, uh, make assessments and announcements soon on submissions that have um, from organisations that can support and expand that work. Um, the COVID changes that Al mentioned, um, yes, internationally um, and nationally and also across Victoria, um, the demand and call for services have increased. Um, and we've all been able to um, stretch um, our understanding of what forums are, for example, with this particular format. And so um, two new digital services will commence um, uh, with rural and regional Victorians' important advice and lived experience to how those service types might be able to roll out and support, as well as the local face-to-face -face and area mental health services. Uh, with reference to workforce, um, certainly a focus on the regional work of workforce is, um, is right in frame. So with that snapshot, I might just drop into some detail, um, comment on some of the initiatives, um, and then hopefully bring us, bring us round um, back to more questions and answers, which is the intent for being here. Um, so we need to transform the way people experiencing mental ill health, mental health on the continuum that Kelly has remind us. Um, and how their families can access support. Access, accessing appropriate supports earlier in the community and closer to support networks is required. And that local area and statewide service model, um, being able to engage, provide helpful responses and being able to provide the right care at the right time, moving from a crisis driven model um, where folks um, turn up to emergency departments and receive inadequate support to a community-based model where access to treatment, care and support can happen in a planned, considered close to home and in community way. So that adjustment will have to flow through the whole of the system. That as we implement um, local services for adults and older adults um, with community accessible points, um, we also need local services for infants and children and families and also services for young people. Um, that the connection between the specialist services, the area services, the hospital services and the local services will be an important part of the system reforms. To formally network services um, together, uh, we don't need um, folks to bounce around between services. We don't need folks to, to retell the story over and over again. Uh, we need to support um, a, a, an integrated service where um, local services um, are, are closer to home and they limit travel as well. In terms of um, regional approaches, the Royal Commission has called for us to do things fundamentally differently in the way we plan the system and the way we um, oversight the system as well. Um, there's a, a call to undertake a statewide plan and in that statewide plan, be very focused on the differences between areas, the differences geographically, demographically, uh, and also uh, need-based assessments. And that will result in both a statewide plan, but importantly, regional plans across all parts of the state. So service plans that lead to uh, confirming and informing uh, the approach to local services and also the approach to local facilities and, um, and buildings and community services. This 
new approach to, to local planning will also be sort of supported by a new approach to regional commissioning. And I would endorse for the folks on the call uh, to look out closely for the first steps in this regard. The Royal Commission has called out for the establishment of eight regional boards, eight regional mental health and wellbeing boards. They're designed to have a deep connection to an in-depth understanding of local communities' strengths and needs and use this understanding and connections to select, fund and monitor providers locally. So this is a very significant and foundational change. Um, we are looking um, to release an expression of interest um, very shortly for chairs for what we're calling interim regional bodies. And the interim regional bodies will be built with five members, including a lived experience representative of someone who's experienced the system, but also lived experience of someone that's caring and has cared for somebody as part of the system. And it's fundamentally and foundationally um, important to us that the, um, that the steps are made rightly and correctly to that regional presence, regional leadership, regional understanding and regional service delivery through the interim regional bodies and ultimately regional boards. On workforce, um, again, uh, picking up Kelly and Al's points, um, that it's, it's a particular concern to rural and regional services to um, create services, create the aspiration for services that ensure that the workforce is there. And so there's a workforce strategy um, that's being developed by the end of this year. Um, there's actually a forum on tomorrow um, that will bring together uh, the beginnings of some of that workforce strategy. So again, I'll endorse um, yourselves as leads and um, focused on mental health needs um, to be aware of that and we can make communications back through the Secretariat on that workforce strategy. Already $11 million has been earmarked for a rural and regional workforce incentive scheme around attracting, training, recruiting um, and supporting retention more importantly. Um, I think Al referenced the idea that um, coming out for a year or two is a good start. We need to find ways to support and enable continuity um, for communities. The, um, the final thing I'll probably mention really is, is ways of working together. Uh, the magnitude of the reforms outlined in the Royal Commission's report uh, and the final report, both interim and final report, uh, will take some time and, as mentioned, will need a staged approach to implementation. And there has been um, current challenges, uh, certainly, and rising need, et cetera. And so it's that balance between the scale of the reform with urgency, which is critical at the moment. The Royal Commission's vision, however, cannot be realised without the support of service providers, workers, uh, people with lived experience and local communities. Um, and importantly, the interim regional bodies will play very important roles in that support, advice and engagement. So uh, we will build on a range of approaches for tools and engagement. Um, we need to think about co-design uh, and, and again, the experience of Al and Kelly in informing the Royal Commission with experience is exactly the sort of continuous conversation we need to have uh, and expanding that um, to include the design of services and the design of approaches and how we set things up. Uh, so there will certainly be um, uh, forums, roundtables, digital platforms, et cetera, which will help that design work. Uh, and we'll absolutely um, look to the regional bodies too to be critical in that lived experience membership that, um, that goes onto those bodies. So uh, the slides that you'll see when the secretary will send them around um, have a, a range of links to websites. So we would absolutely um, encourage folks looking to the websites and looking for updates. Um, we all collectively have a significantly vested interest in ensuring the system is an empowering one that cares, supports all of us, families, loved ones, with kindness and compassion in ways that the system has not been able to. And the powerful opportunity that exists in front of us is to recognise and build on the strength and resilience of rural communities, as mentioned, through difficult and uncertain times. Again, Al's reference to um, local services and local responses and which our experience at the beginning have strong and really powerful responses to health settings which are critical and important driven by local residents. So reaffirming um, regional and rural communities 
including the farming community, are a priority focus in the implementation of the reform agenda. Thank you for time today. Um, I'm sure you'll have questions and we welcome questions and discussion, uh, but there'll be further work coming, of course, to engage. Thanks, Alison. Thanks very much, Matthew. Um, that was a really sorry explanation. And, and as Matthew said, we will um, be able to share his slides on our website um, from today. Uh, so we've got some questions coming through now in the Q&A and I just do um, just remind everyone again that there is a, a Q&A um, section at the bottom of your screen that you can tap on and type your question in. Uh, the first question here is for both Al and Kelly. So um, maybe Al, you might want to respond first and then we'll um, go to Kelly for a response as well. I'll, I'll um, reread the question for you, Kelly. Don't feel you need to uh, remember it first time round. Um, so Al, uh, do you think that community led programs such as raising awareness of local services through community events resilience and mental health training, or bringing local people together to talk about mental health, make a difference in smaller rural communities? Yeah, cracker question. Yeah, 100%. Well, you, you think about a small local community, whether it's Skipton or wherever it might be, like country people are renowned for togetherness, whether it's the football, netball club, or something else in between. So I think 100% that that's, I guess that, that, that sums up rural Victoria and rural Australia for that fact in, 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 one, in one breath. It's, it's, it's that community is what really is rural Australia. And, 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 and I know just from my observation of travelling around, the more remote you get, the more that becomes essential, whether it's for mental health or just for having a good time. So my answer, that's 100%, yes, it is. And Kelly, what are your thoughts on uh, those community-led programs and how helpful they are in rural communities? Yep, I'm the same as Al, 100%. I think they are probably the only way you will get through to some of those really small rural communities. Um, rural people value relationships, so they, are, they value people and relationships and um, it's definitely something I think I've noticed. I grew up in um, south of England and coming over here, I think the strength of rural communities is huge and it's, there's a really, really good resource there if you can tap into it. So, um, yeah, I think to, that's the only way I think you're going to get traction in those more remote areas. Thanks, Kelly. Um the next question is directed at Matthew. Um, so this is from David who said there would be, uh, Matthew said there would be 700 to $800 million available for regional Victoria. Uh, does that really stand up if it includes Ballarat? And I, I'm thinking from David that he's meaning that this is more of a, a regional centre rather than um, a, a real rural area. Yeah, that's correct, David. Uh, David, a great question. Um, of course, in the way we have the system model at the moment is the regional services tend to be um, unfairly and inequ inequitably focused for mental health responses across the state of Victoria. Uh, the regional services um, of Golden Valley, of La Trobe Regional Hospital, of Albury Health, of Bendigo, of Ballarat, of Barwon, of Warrnambool. Um, Mildura is probably the outstanding one. Um, the emphasis has been uh, for too long on that regional um, setting and the expectation that those services are able and are rightful services to cover um, the broader geographic catchment. And, and this is the, the opportunity and the challenge, David, to pick up your question, is for us to get the local services to where we need them and the area services supporting adequately and appropriately. Um, that's why with interest we're looking at places like Benalla uh, and through the um, Latrobe Valley to um, areas and towns where local services can, can stand up and, as both Kelly and Alice said, endorse the idea of local services being able to hold the community conversation, gather community together and create pathways for access. In terms of the resourcing question, um, it's only beginning. 
um, activity-based funding, um, not to bore everybody with you know, bureaucratic <laughs> pieces, but it's really critical that we look to the issue of rural Victoria and regional Victoria and remote settings more broadly, to how we actually fund and resource appropriately, that a, a price we might pay for a service in a more, um, in a more um, populated area, for example, needs to be recognised as having greater resource needs in an area where um, the population is different. So we would expect over time, picking up your question, David, that we have a setting and a resetting to the distribution um, of the, the funds across rural settings. Thanks, Matthew. Um, the next question is also uh, for Matthew, and, and maybe Elle might want to comment on this one as well. Um, so given the, the lived experience shared here today, and specifically Elle's comments regarding bush nursing centres, and access in those settings, would there be benefiting collaborations um, with a group like the Royal Flying Doctor Service who've experience in mobile services to smaller settings, um, especially if those with lived experience are involved? Are I being appropriately respectful? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll call it and I'll say, Matthew, if you go first and then we'll cross uh, to you. I'm going to jump first. Um, I think the bush nursing centres, um, it's a, thanks, Mona, for the question. The bush nursing centres are an absolute untouched, untouched and untapped resource in terms of emotional well-being and supports. And as referenced before, the bushfires, um, there's a lovely and really important and powerful work coming out of the northeast and the east of Sand parts of Victoria where the bush nursing centres are proving um, over and over again and time and time again at that community capacity engagement that they have and that destigmatizing approach um, and wonderful models like walking groups and engagement and connection and connectivity which again Kelly and Al have endorsed happen through community settings and the RFDS and the connections and collaborations are really key and critical. Um, for me the, the question um, that always arises is great to connect and create a pathway but when there's a need for some extra support call it some specialty support or other support, we need as soon as possible that connection to be made in a seamless way. I think I might have mentioned in the in the overview, um, there needs to be no breaks in the system. Someone connecting through a bush nursing centre doesn't have to take a number and go and find another pathway and tell their story again. That would be, for me, a disappointing outcome of the Royal Commission's recommendations if the system was set up for that. But how we create that the absolute integration so that somebody who needs an extra layer of support gets that support in a way that doesn't create any gap for them is a really critical one. And acknowledge RFDS are doing some really powerful work um, across this country, but also across Victoria in providing some um, really important um, uh, responses to where workforce shortage exists. Great, thanks, Matthew. And Al, how do you see um, lived experience being involved, I guess, in the development of, of those services, um, if we're looking kind of at utilising mobile services or, or um, online services to smaller settings? Yeah, so I, I'd, I'd reiterate that the Bush Nursing Centres are an untapped resource and, and the Royal Flying Doctors. Now, the name of the program has eluded me at the moment, but I know in New South Wales, the Royal Flying Doctors have a service which is a community-based Kind of program which I think was instigated by a, a station owner out sort of Broken Hill direction, I believe. I'm a big way on it, but when I saw it about 18 months ago, I just my ears pricked up and said, This has got legs. And I, I know the Royal Flying Doctors have, have actually have got that going. I, I just I'm a bit vague on the details, but it really did prick at my ears and, and it was a community-based sort of like you know, check on your mates kind of thing. So but Yes, there's, there's a lot of resources out there which are there for the using that just quite aren't quite getting used how they maybe could be, I guess. So there's the challenge for Matt and his team. And I guess those of us with lived experience can really, you know, um, guide how those services might be integrated and, and um, developed within farming communities and tailored to those needs as well. So a really important part of that, I think, that, that lived experience. Uh, There's a question for Matthew from Janice. Um, so digital and online services are not always accessible. Uh, poor or lack of connectivity continues to be a problem 
uh, in many rural areas. Often people don't have access to suitable equipment to take advantage of the services, um, not the type of thing you want to do at the library, uh, or have digital literacy or skills to access services. Reliable internet and phone services is a little harder to fix in the short term, but has there been any thought to supporting skills development to lift digital skills for individuals? Thanks, Janice. Um, that's a, a classic, a classic example of the co-design piece of work we need to undertake. In that, um, the best laid plans and the bestly um, laid out, um, you know, digital health structure uh, will fall upon the rocks of good ideas if it doesn't actually have exactly that comment you've made there. Um, the digital divide, both in terms of the technology. Uh, in terms of access and in terms of comfort, safety and quality of delivery of services that you're picking up in your question about settings and libraries and other, other service points are really important. Um, so uh, has there been thought to spotting skills? Um, yes, that you were know, early days in thinking about this digital health strategy, but absolutely it's right in front and centre. And that question that we would need to um, take absolute clarity from what I did lived experience and not with the service users would be what will work and what skills are needed. So Janice, thank you for the question. You've nailed that co-design component of that really beautifully. Thanks, Matthew. And, and I think that something that we've noticed um, at the National Centre for Pharma Health during COVID, um, you know, if we can think of there being any silver lining to COVID, one of those that we've noticed is that people's comfort, I guess, and willingness to uh, utilise um, online technology to, to access various services, not just mental health, but, um, you know, kind of almost being forced in some ways to access things through online services has made people more comfortable overall. So, you know, hopefully that will augur well for digital um, service delivery in the future and, and make people more willing to I guess, take that step. And it's not just community members, but it's often service providers as well who are required to develop that comfort and confidence in using online services. So many steps still to take, I think. Um, now, here's a question for Al. Uh, so this is from Susan. So Al, looking back to your experience being discharged out of A&E, what would have been helpful to you um, if you had to re-experience this again? Oh, <laughs> I haven't thought about that. I, oh, I suppose I have. It, at the time, I needed, I needed support Im immediately. Like, oh, I'll be black and white about it. I was suicidal. Um, and, yeah, and that's not a good place to be. So I guess... For one of a better analogy, someone to hold my hand, I guess. Um, I was never hospitalised. Um, I'm not sure if I should have been or not. That's that's but it's in the past. But it's, I guess, just that someone to not not give up. I, I guess someone just to, because I, I didn't have, I didn't at that at that stage. I was a single man, and 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 so I didn't have that someone to go home to. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but for the system's point of view, I, I don't know what the answer is. You know, do they, do they, you know, in that situation, do you put someone into hospital just to make sure they're safe? I, I, I'm not professionally trained in this, so I don't really probably want to make statements I can't sort of back up without evidence. But for my personal view, I... I needed I needed to be cared for. It was I guess um, I did make it, so that's a good thing. But um, yeah, at, at the time, yeah, it was pretty challenging. I don't know did that answer the question or not. I'm not really sure. I, I think your reference there, Al, about being needed needed to be cared for um, is such an important one. It's it's not just the kind of the physical care that you would have required. It's the fact that somebody is actually caring for your welfare and, you know, you're not being turfed out onto the streets, you know, for want of a better description. Um, yeah. So it is that kind of whole extra level of, of care. Mm, mm. Thank you. Let's ask Al, sorry, I couldn't work out how to type in the Q&A. Um, <laughs> would you, in that experience, so like you're saying, you just you just want someone to hold your hand. 
Do you think you'd get more value from someone with lived experience versus someone with clinical psych training? That's a good question, Kelly. It's, I guess in my, from my own experience, probably lived experience, um, you know, somebody that can understand that, that to, 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 they don't have to go, oh, I know what you're going through because they don't know what you're going through. Nobody knows what that person's going through, but it's, I guess, but, but to, to add to further to that, there's obviously a, a vast array of mental health issues. Um, so everybody's is different. So for me, it probably would have been lived ex- someone with lived experience, but the next person could be more clinical. So I, I, yeah, it's such a broad, yeah, if you go to a doctor with a broken arm, the fix is the same for everybody, but broken heads are a bit of a different story, of course. Yeah. Thanks, Al. And look, we have got more questions coming in um, at the moment, but I realise that we're kind of coming to the end of our timeline for this event. Um, I think, you know, if you watch this space, I think there is room for more discussion um, around around this. And I think we may have an opportunity in the coming weeks to perhaps pick up this discussion again. So we'll, we'll keep you all in the loop uh, about what might be available there. But for today, I would really like to thank our panel members, um, Al, Kelly and Matthew. It's been a really fabulous discussion. Um, you can just see, you know, kind of the, the ideas being generated and, and I can see Matthew taking notes here as well. So I think that's, it's, yeah, exactly. Um, so really valuable to hear both from our audience and from our lived experience members on the panel today. Uh, so just a reminder to everybody that this uh, webinar has been recorded. So we will be sharing it on our Pharma Health website. There is a dedicated Royal Commission page. Uh, and we will keep people notified about um, a further event to continue this discussion because I think we're really just getting into it uh, and we haven't been able to address all of the questions today. So please do watch this space and thank you very much again for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Ali, too, for bringing all this together and giving us the opportunity to share our stories and um, yeah, you're doing some really great work, so keep it up. Yeah, thanks, Al. Thanks, you, Matt. Matthew. Okay. Thanks, all. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.